Amen. So the title of the sermon this morning is Resolve to Read. Resolve to Read. And of course, we're coming up on the new year. This is a time of year when a lot of people are starting to think about their resolutions, uh, what they're going to change this year. At least they should be. I think that's a really good habit to get into, to think about the past year and how you're going to improve on yourself and your walk with God or whatever area of life it is. You know, A lot of people make a lot of different resolutions this time of year, but probably the most, life, the, the most uh, life-changing, the most profound uh, resolution that anybody could make uh, this year would be the resolution to read the Bible, read the Bible, and to at least have read it one time through. You say, you know, uh, you know this is a subject that you preach uh, about this time every year, and that's true. That's because of the fact that I, I know that I'll get up and I'll preach this, and yet six months from now, there'll still be people who have not begun to even read their Bible. There will still be people who get to this time next year that have never read the Bible through. And let me just come out and say it. If you've never read the Bible cover to cover uh, once in your life, that needs to be the number one priority in your Christian life this next year. You need to do that before you do anything else. You can have all these other resolutions, but at the top of that list, you should resolve to read the Bible because of the fact that the Bible is going to take, make such a profound impact on every area of your life. I mean, think about all the other resolutions people are going to make this year. They're going to make re resolutions about their finances. They're going to make resolutions about their health. They're going to make resolutions about their family and all these other things. Well, you know what? The one thing that's going to help you in all those areas is Bible reading. You know, if you read the Bible, it's going to help you in every single other area of your life. There's no part of your life that the Bible does not address. It addresses our health. It addresses our finances. It addresses our families. It addresses our child rearing, our relationships, our friendships. It touches every other area of life. So there is no other resolution that you could make that's going to touch every other area of your life other than Bible reading. Resolve to read your Bible this year. Look there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You know, a lot of people get in this, this, uh, this rut of only reading a little bit of, of the Bible. They might only read a proverb of a day. They might have a, you know, a devotional. I remember when I first got started out in the Christian life, people handed me, you know, I was handed more than one devotional. Here's, here's your daily Bible reading. It would be, you know, a, a, a verse and then like a page of somebody else's thoughts. That's not a, a devotional. That is not Bible reading. Bible reading is sitting down and reading the Bible cover to cover. Now, I'm not against devotionals. You know, that's fine. If you want to have one of those, just be careful what you're reading. A lot of times they're filled with error. But, you know, if there's some nice thought you want to get, some, you know, proverb of the day, I'm all for that too. But don't let that become a substitute for your daily Bible reading of sitting down and making a plan to read the Bible through at least once this year. Because it says there that all Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, every single book in the Bible beginning in Genesis all the way to Revelation, is profitable. There's nothing else that's going to profit you more in this life than the Bible. So read it. Read the Bible from beginning to end. All Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You say, I want to be a better Christian this year. I want to have a better prayer life. I want to be a better soul winner. I want to start soul winning. I want to start praying or whatever. You want to improve some area in your life as a Christian, well, the Bible says that it is profitable for instruction in righteousness, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, complete and entire, wanting nothing, as it says in James. That's the use of the word perfect there. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know, if you want to improve in some other area of your life, you need to read the Bible. Because the Bible is going to give you the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding and how to excel in that area of, of your life. If you make some other resolution, there's wisdom in the Bible to be had that's going to help you in that resolution. So resolve to read your Bible this morning, this ne in this coming year. You know, if we resolve to do the, the Bible reading, you know, so many of the other things that we want to, 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 uh, to, to uh, endeavor to do would just fall into place. So many other things would just follow through. The prayer, the soul winning, the church attendance, our attitudes, our actions, our purity, all of these other things would just start to fall in place if we would just resolve to read the Bible on a daily basis. You know, I thought of an illustration to kind of to make this point, and, and, and hopefully that I can make this clear and, and, and it makes sense. But let's say I were to go somewhere and I needed you to meet me there. Okay, I said, hey, I'm going to be on the other side of town. I'm going to be at this location. And, you know, I know it's, it's you say, well, I'll just use GPS. Okay, but let's just pretend we don't have that, all right, for a minute. Let's go back, you know, to the 80s or whatever. 
you know, 90s probably. I don't know when GPS became a thing for everybody, but the advent of the smartphone and so on. Well, let's just pretend, you know, you went full minimalist, got rid of your smartphone. You just, you know, you're old school. You don't have, you don't have access to a GPS. And I went back to the, you know, like they did in the day where I wrote out, you know, handwritten instructions. You know, you're going to pull out of the parking lot. You're going to take a right on Grant. You're going to go past, you know, underneath the 10. You're going to go a few miles. And I don't know Tucson that well, so I, that's about as far as I can get you. <laughs> that's, how, that's about how far I go, right? But let's say I gave you handwritten instructions, say I need you to meet me at this time, at this day, at this place. You know, and, and let's say that was a month from now. I say a month from now, I'm going to be at this place. I need you to meet me there at this time, you know, exactly one month from now. And I just gave you these detailed instructions on how to get there. You know, if you took those instructions out and you diligently read them every day, you just run over them every single day for like 30 days, whatever, you know, that, that the every day that went by until that, that meeting, you were reading it, you'd probably get to the place where you, you could probably just get there without having to look at them again because you would know those instructions so well, you know what I mean? If you just spent every day reading it and reading it and understanding the instructions of how to get from point A to point B, when the day came that you needed to get to point B, you could leave point A and probably not even have to look at the instructions because you're so familiar with the instructions. You've thought about it, you've read it, you've rehearsed it in your mind, you've imagined the route, you've gone over it, you know how to get there. You could find me without even needing those instructions on the day of. But what about if you never read them? Do you think you could find me? What if you just never read them? Maybe you just never, not, what about even the day of, you're just like, oh, I'll find Brother Corbin. And you just, just got rid of, the day I gave you the instructions, you're just like, I don't need these. I'll find him. And then you're just wandering around Tucson trying to move, Brother Corbin, Brother Corbin, you know, trying to find me. You're going to have to read those instructions at some point to come find me. Right? And, that's, and, 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 you know, as silly as that sounds, a lot of people live their Christian life that way. You know, God has given us instructions on how to go from point A to point B, how to, how to, how to tra you know, traverse through this life, how to live this life. God has given us big, thick book of instructions. But do we read it? You know, we need to become so familiar with the instructions that God has given to us that, you know, we can find our way to heaven and get there and hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, not everybody's going to hear those words. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're going to get to heaven and God's going to be pleased with you. You know, the Bible says there are going to be some people that are saved even so as by fire. You know, all their works are going to be burned up, but they themselves shall be saved even yet so as by fire. You know, it's, it's not a matter of working your way to heaven, but are you want to just get to heaven and just say, well, you know, at least I'm here. And then look back and think about, and God's going, well, you know, you could have had this reward, you could have had this reward, you could have had this crown, and you could have had this, and you could have done, and I would have given you this, this, and this. And yeah, and you're in heaven, and it's great. But you know what? There's a lot of things that we need to know and understand and learn from the Bible that are going to help that journey go smoothly, help it get us to point A to point B. Is that making sense this morning, that illustration? Hopefully that made sense. You know, it's a silly illustration, but you know what? What's even sillier or even sadder is the fact that a lot of Christians, it's exactly how they live their life. They're saved. They're on their way to heaven. They know they're going there, but they're, they're just stumbling through life. They're just tripping all over themselves making mistakes in this area, messing up this relationship, you know, not ever getting this sin out of their life, never starting this godly practice because they don't read the instructions. They don't resolve to read their Bible. Look, if you read your Bible, I've heard it said, and I believe this to be 100% accurate. If you were to be, if you were, sat down this year and said, I'm going to read my Bible cover to cover, you would be an elite group. You would probably be in like 1% to 5% of all Christians. The vast majority of Christians go through, and it's sad, but it's just, a, it's just a case. It's just the way it is. They go through this life, and they never read the Bible. They go years. They'll go decades and never have read the Bible one time. You know, and you think about the, the Bible itself, why wouldn't you read it? I mean, it's the greatest work of English literature, of all literature ever, ever created. And those that are reading their Bible know this is true, that the more you read it, the more you want to read it. The more the, 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 the passages speak to you, the more uh, you're just moved to read it. There's so many great gems in there. Why wouldn't you want to read it? It'd be like if I uh, brought out a treasure, treasure chest full of you know, all kinds of gold and silver and everything else and just said, it's all yours. And you just said, well, no thanks. You know, and then just continue to go through life struggling to make ends meet. Well, meanwhile, there's just this wealth waiting for you that you just refuse to touch. You know, you can apply that spiritually. 
People are, are, are starving spiritually. They're, they're in spiritual poverty. They don't have the riches. They don't have the fullness of the knowledge of Christ. And God has given us this treasure chest called the Bible. And if we would just open it and read it, even, and I'm not saying you have to sit down and read for hours at a time, although there would be nothing wrong with that. But if you could at least resolve to read the Bible one time this year, that's my challenge. You know, last time I preached a sermon, I, I kind of was, I upped it. I said, hey, you know, you need to re try reading it multiple times. And I gave some advice on how to read multiple times. And I think that's great. But you know what? The fact is, most people need to just work on reading it one time. Just once this year. And you know, if you've never read it, that's the goal. Just read it one time this year. <coughs> go to, uh, go to uh, Proverbs chapter 12, 22. Proverbs chapter 22. Go into Proverbs chapter 22. Let, let me start reading in verse 17 of Proverbs 22. It says, Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. <coughs> and really, that's the reason why a lot of people don't read. It's because it's effort. You know, we're living in a, in a, in a day and age where, you know, we want to just turn on the television, pick up the smartphone, look at the tablet, and just have information kind of spoon-fed to us. We want to just skim through some feed somewhere and have somebody speak to us and entertain us and just keep us preoccupied from one moment to the next. But, you know, that's not going to make you a, a spiritually sound individual. That's not going to impart unto you any, you know, spiritual wisdom doing that. In fact, it's probably just going to make you dumber. You know, a lot of that stuff just dumbs us down. You know, develop this short attention span where it's just, I mean, these apps that are out there like this, you know, TikTok, where it's like, what, or even Instagram, like where it's like you have 60 seconds to say something and then it's on to the next video. You know, people, they just, this is what they do. And they just, it's the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And, you know, but that's not the Bible. You know, it, to get real wisdom, you have to do what? You have to apply your heart unto knowledge. You have to sit down and focus and actually, you know, have an attention span that's going to allow you to absorb the Word of God. And you can tell when people are doing this, you know, and, and, and it's, kind of a, it's kind of a mixed blessing in a way because people email, email the church and I can tell which people are, are reading their Bible through from their emails because they'll, they'll come up with all the same questions. Like, what are the sons of God? You know, you can tell, they'll, they'll email you and they'll have a question about Genesis and then a few weeks later they have a question in Judges and then a few weeks later they have a, a question, you know, in First you know, Chronicles or whatever. You can see how they have all, the, and it's always the same questions and you're kind of like, oh, man. again, you know, I've got to answer this question again, but, you know, God bless them because you can tell they're at least reading their Bible. You know, and that, maybe that's a little tip right there. You know, as you read your Bible, don't get hung up on things you don't understand. I think it's a problem. A lot of, one reason a lot of people don't ever, fit, like they start out reading their Bible and then they get into something and they, they want to study that out. They want to like, oh, let me figure out who the sons of God are and so on and so forth. Look, that's great and fine to do. And there's lots of, you know, we could direct you towards sermons that'll explain that very quickly. Or you could ask somebody that, that can explain that kind of stuff. But how about when it comes to just Bible reading, if you don't find something, that you, if you, or if you find something you don't understand, you know, maybe highlight it and just keep going. You know, the answer might be in the next page, in the next chapter, the next, in the next book, the next testament. You know, it might be that you have to, you know, God does that in, the, in, his, in his word. There's some things that aren't entirely, entirely clear in the Old Testament. You get the New Testament, you're like, oh, this really makes sense now. You can see it all comes together. But he says there in, in Proverbs chapter 22 to hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. You know, you're going to have to apply yourself if you're going to gain the wisdom that God has for you. And look, it's wisdom that God has for all of his children. Every single believer has access to this wisdom. The Bible says in 1 John that you need not that any man teacheth you, but by the, 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 the same spirit of anointing uh, which you have teacheth you all things. And I'm paraphrasing, but... The Bible tells us that we, because we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Word of God, there's nothing off limits to us. You know, but don't expect God to just pour out these golden nuggets of wisdom and knowledge and understanding if all you're going to give Him, you know, is, is a cheesy devotional, you know, every other day or something like that. If you're not diligent in applying your heart and bowing down your ear and hearing the words of the wise, don't expect to hear the words of the wise. You have, there's, a, there's a process here. The bowing down of the ear the hearing of the wise, applying your heart unto, unto my knowledge. You say, well, why should I? Look, well, look at verse 18. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. You know, that's such a great verse talking about how, 
You know, if you keep God's words, if you apply yourself, if you bow down your ear, if you hear the words of the wise, it's a pleasant thing. If you keep them within you, the word of God will begin to, to dwell in you. The Bible says to let the word of Christ dwell richly within, within you richly with all wisdom. And when we allow that to happen, we become familiar with the word of God and we understand what it says, you know, eventually those things will be fitted into our lips. Someone says, well, why do you do that? Why do you live that way? Why do you say that? Why do you believe that? Well, because you've done the reading, you know why. It's not just because, well, that's what my church does. Well, that's what Brother Corbin said to do. It's because I read it in the Bible for myself, and here's what the Bible says. This is why we do what we do. This is why we believe what we believe. Because it's within you, and now it's fitted in your lips. And it's a pleasant thing when that, when that the Bible says when that happens. And the Bible says that uh, you know, a word sp spoken in due season, how sweet it is. Look at verse 19. That thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Look at verse 20. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsel and knowledge that I might make, no, make thee know the certainty of the words of truth? I mean, I think big reason why Christians don't read the Bible is because they don't realize what they have. They take it for granted. He's saying, have not I written to thee excellent things and counsel? And knowledge. I mean, we, we go through life and we struggle in so many areas. Oh, I wish I had wisdom and understanding. My parents didn't teach me this. The school system taught me the complete opposite. You know, this culture is teaching me something totally different. I wish I had the knowledge and the understanding to be able to know how to handle the situation, how to live my life. And God's saying, have not I written unto thee? God's saying, I've done it. The wisdom's there. The knowledge is there. I, you know, he, I want to make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. I've written it. The question is, have you read it? You have to get into it and read it. We have to apply our heart that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sin unto thee. See, the Bible has wisdom and instruction for every area of our life. Go over to the book of... Uh, keep something in, in Proverbs. We'll be back in that area eventually. Just go over to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. We all know the proverb of Matthew 7. The, 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 the instruction of, uh, or the... Uh, the, the the, the wise man and the foolish man. You know, the one built his house upon the sand, the one built his house upon the rock. And Jesus said that everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto the foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Look, there's a lot of people today building their houses, their lives on the shifting sands of everything that is not the word of God. Because the Bible tells us what the rock is. And he says, and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and, the, and, and, the, and beat upon the house, and great was the fall of it. He goes on to say that, the, that whosoever shall dig deep and lay his foundation upon the rock, you know, the, the, the same storms are going to come, the same winds are going to blow, but that house shall stand. Why? Because it was built upon the rock, and the, that rock are his sayings, his word, his words. The Bible is the rock that which we have to build our lives based upon. You know, people ought to take, make every decision based upon the Bible. I believe that. Every decision you make in life, you should say, well, what does the Bible say? And whatever the Bible says, line up your life with what the Bible says. And you know what you'll be doing? You'll be building your life upon a rock. You know, and people might scratch their head and wonder what you're doing or why you're making those decisions, but you know what? When the same storm comes, it's going to hit them, it's going to hit you, it's, the, the outcome's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be a stark difference there. Their house is going to crumble and fall over time, and yours is going to strand, stand strong and firm because it's built upon the rock. It might not make sense to them at the time, but they'll say, oh boy, well, that turned out nice for you. Well, yeah, because I actually took the time to read what the Bible had to say, and then I did it. Like it says in James, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves, your own selves. You have to be not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of it. But look, how are you going to be a doer of it? How are you going to build your foundation upon the rock if you've never even read it? You don't even know what it says. You don't know what the Bible says about child rearing. You don't know what the Bible says about uh, marriage relationships. We don't even know what the Bible says about friendships and, and all these other areas of life. I mean, you just pick an area of life and then ask yourself, do I have a biblical answer for that? What does the Bible say about that subject? And there's a lot to know, isn't there? You know, and I, here's the thing. You, you're not going to download that information overnight. You're not just going to plug in a card somewhere in your brain and, and now I have that. It's not the matrix, people. You know, you have to actually take the time to read it and let that sink in and sink in. And a lot of things you read, you have to read again and then you have to read again, you have to be reminded again. 
And we have to read these things if we're going to build our house upon the rock of the Word of God. And then we can learn how to do them. Are you in Psalm 119? Look at verse 97. Psalm 119, verse 97. <coughs> Psalm 119, verse 97. Says, oh, how I love thy law. I love that, that phrase that David makes. Or how I love thy law. You know, a lot of Christians today, they would say, oh, the law, you know, it's okay. You know, it served its purpose back then. But you know what? We know that's not true. That all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. And David here understands it. He says, I love thy law. I love the Old Testament. I love the New Testament. I love what God said back then. I and, he's saying, and he hasn't changed. It's not like he's saying anything different. But I love God's word through and through, from the beginning to the end. I love all of it. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies. What is it that made him wiser than his enemies? God's commandments. Was it David's own intellect? His own cunning craftiness? Was it his own uh, you know, uh, street smarts or whatever? No. What made him wiser than his enemies was God's commandments. And it wasn't just the fact that God wrote some commandments down. It was the fact that it was his meditation all the day. I mean, he was, he was thinking about the Word of God. Getting up, you know, that's a good test to see where you're at spiritually. What's the first thing you wake up, think of when you wake up in the morning? Sometimes, I often do that. I'll wake up and I'll think, why am I even thinking about that? Some vain, trivial thing, and I'll know I'm, 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 I'm doing right or I need to, if I'm not, you know, I know I need to pick up the pace or work on some area of my life if I'm not waking up and thinking about godly things. If I'm not thinking about what I've read the day before, or, or what I'm going to be preaching that week, or something I heard in preaching, or something I read in the Bible. You know, I like to think, I, I often check myself when I wake up in the morning. Say, what was the first thing I thought of? What's for breakfast, right? <laughs> That's probably what goes through everybody's mind, right? You know, or, and you know what? There's, I'm not saying you can't ever have your own personal thought, you know what I mean? But obviously we all have to think about the responsibilities that we have, things to do, goals, so on and so forth. But is there any time during the day where we're just meditating and thinking? Do we find ourselves drifting back to the Word of God? Do we find our minds when they wander, wandering to the things of Christ or to the things of the world? You know, if we spent more time in the Bible, reading the Bible, thinking about the Bible, you know, this would happen probably quite naturally. It's, it's, I love it so much that it's my meditation all the day. You know, a lot of times if we want to memorize or meditate on something, we have to force ourselves into it. But if we love God's law, if we love the Bible, if we love reading it, and you find yourself in it, and you're reading it because you want to, not just because you have to, you know what's going to happen is it's just going to become your meditation all the day. You're going to be thinking about what you read that morning, thinking about what you're going to read in that evening, so on and so forth. And that is what's going to make you wiser than your enemies. And, you know, we have enemies, you know, it, it, especially spiritually speaking. You know, we have the devil walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, there are many antichrists that are got out into the world. There's, there's evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Perilous times shall come. You know, we have to stand. We have to put on the whole armor of God. And a big part of that is the Bible. And if we're not reading it, we're not meditating upon it, you know what? We're not going to be wiser than our enemies. They're going to be wiser than us, and we'll be deceived. You see people who get deceived and caught up in false doctrine, you go... How did you come to believe that? Well, I, I, I wonder, have they been reading their Bible? Or they're following somebody who's wrapped up in grievous error. You know, some preacher gets up and starts preaching damnable heresy or something just, some, you know, just strange, odd thing that's just completely off base from Scripture and everybody just sits in the pulpit and just says, well, oh, makes sense to me. It's like, are you, you must not be reading your Bible. How do you explain the fact that false doctrine just gets preached from across pulpits every single Sunday in this country. And I'm saying from Baptist churches. Preachers get up and just preach error. You know, maybe not, and not knowingly, but, you know, they themselves haven't done the reading. And then they have a crowd full of people that aren't doing the reading, and nobody catches it. And this, this lies and these false doctrines are just perpetuated and they go on and on and on. He says in verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. You know, you want to you wanna outsmart your teacher? You want to grow past the person that you're following? The person, you know, who's, who's, who's leading you? The Word of God will do that for you. You know, 
And I'm not, he's not doing that out of, you know, saying out of some vain glory, like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm smarter than the preacher. I know more better. I know the Bible better. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that's the way this church is. You know, that we have a church where there's people that know the Bible. That when you get up and preach, you better be careful what you say. You better know what you're talking about. Because, you know, you, people will take you aside and say, hey, you know what, actually, have you considered this? You know, and, and that's a blessing. You know, as a preacher, it keeps you on your toes, right? But what David is saying here is that <coughs> I, understand, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Why? For thy testimonies are my meditation. It was the word of God that made him wise. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. And he's not saying this in a haughty way. All he's doing is he's praising God for his word. All he's doing is extolling the word of God and expressing how much he loves it. And he's talking about all the benefits that come with it. It gives you wisdom. It makes you smarter than your teacher. It makes you smarter than the ancient. It makes you wiser than your enemies. What? The word of God and nothing else. The reading of the word of God. Look at verse 101. I have refrained my feet from e every evil way that I might keep thy word. You know, when you start reading the Bible and getting into it, you start to realize the sin that's in your life. And then you start to say, I'm going to refrain my feet from every evil way. You got Because a big part of that, I think, is because you start to learn about who God is. And you learn that God is a God that does not have pleasure in unrighteousness, that he chastens his children, that he's angry with the wicked every day, that God is a God of holiness and righteousness and purity, and that his ways are above our ways, and his thoughts are, are far above our thoughts. And you read that, you know what it causes you to do is to refrain your feet from every evil way. Maybe some of those sins that you were involved in, you say, oh, well, you know, I've been reading my Bible and God doesn't like that, and I know who God is, and I want to be pleasing to him, so I'm going to refrain my feet from that evil way. You know, the, reading the Bible will keep you pure. Reading the Bible will keep you from committing certain sins. I'm not saying it's going to be, you know, some kind of magical experience, but where you just read the Bible and I'm never tempted by sin again. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying if you read the Bible, you're going to know what, sin is, what is a sin, what isn't a sin, what happens when you sin. You know, and when next time you're tempted with your sin, you're gonna, some Bible verse is going to come to mind. If you've been meditating and reading on the Word of God, you say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to upset God. Reading the Bible will make you wiser, smarter, and will help you to refrain your feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Look at verse 102. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I mean, this is a guy that just loves the Bible. He loves reading the Bible. He loves God's words. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. You ever seen anybody who just gets really impassioned about about false doctrine or sin. You ever see a preacher or somebody who just, even a layman who just, they hear some false teaching, they, hear some, they see some sin taking place and they just get mad to the point where they hate it? That's because that person's been reading the word of God and they love it. Because they care more about you know, the, the truth and, and, and being, having integrity with the word of God than anything else. And when they see that being violated, you know what? They hate that. It bothers them. They get passionate about it. You know, then some people, they just kind of go, oh, well, what's the big deal? Yeah, I know it's wrong, but they really don't get upset. You know, that person probably doesn't love the Word of God the way, they think, the way that they should or the way that they think they do. So again, I'm just talking about, you know, resolve to read your Bible this year. That's the topic here this morning. And let me just go ahead. You know, I've already kind of been giving you some reasons to read. You know, hopefully this portion was more of an inspiration. You know, trying to inspire you to read the God. If you want to be wiser, if you want to be smarter, if you want to be able to, you know, uh, improve every other area of your life. Because people, again, they're making all these resolutions this year. The Bible has all the answers that are going to help you in every other, ever, every other resolution you could possibly make. So make reading the Bible the number one resolution. And hopefully, the, you know, this first portion has been, you know, a bit of an inspiration. But let me just give you some other practical reasons why you should read your Bible. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. How about, here's a reason to read the Bible. Because it's commanded. Because it's commanded. Maybe you're sitting there this morning and you're like, well, you know, I know my life's not perfect, but it's good enough. Uh, you know, I know there's some areas I'm struggling with or things I don't have understanding in or I'm lacking wisdom in some area. But I'm okay with that. You know, I've made it this far or, you know, I, I'm surely that's not going to affect me. You know, you're a young person. You're thinking you're six feet tall and bulletproof. 
and you know you're going to make it through life just fine without reading the Bible. And you don't need you don't you need to love his law. You don't need to have it be your meditation. You're not worrying about you know his testimonies or having more understanding than all these other people. But let me just give so let me just give you if that's you some other reasons to read the Bible. How about first of all, it's commanded to read the Bible, regardless of how you feel about it, regardless of whether or not you're excited, whether or not you know you don't wake up and say, oh, that thy word is sweeter to my mouth than than the honeycomb. It's sweeter than honey to my taste. Maybe that's not you. Maybe you wake up and you think of the Bible and you think, well, it just looks like a bland bowl of white rice or something. You know, it's just some plain food to me. I don't get that excited about it. Doesn't matter. You still need to, you know, proverbially speaking, you got to, you know, belly up to the table and eat your veggies all the same. You know, whether, whether you look at the Word of God and it's a big bowl of dripping honey or it's a big plate of, you know, boiled Brussels sprouts or boiled spinach. Ugh, right? I like spinach in a salad, but if you boil that stuff, ugh. And my wife, you know, she's trying to get her iron in. She's been having me boil spinach this whole time and feed it to her, the salt. And she, I just, I don't know how she eats it. And you thought childbirth was rough, but they were eating that spinach. is like, to me, it looks, uh, anyway. But what I'm saying is this, like, whether or not the word of God to you is a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch, like I've been enjoying recently, <laughs> right? Or a bowl of spinach. Either way, you got to eat. You got to eat. It's commanded. You need it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18. And it shall be when he, this is talking about the king, right? The king of Israel. When he sitteth upon this throne of his kingdom, he shall write him a copy, uh, him a, a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. They say, well, that's for kings. This is Old Testament. Yeah, but the Bible teaches us that we, as God's chosen people who are saved by Christ, God has made us kings and priests. That we are a chosen, a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. God has made us to rule and reign with Him. So you can apply this to you. okay? Because whether you realize it or not, you are a king in Christ. You, know, you are royalty today. Because think about it. If you're saved, you're an heir. You're a co-heir with Christ. That's what the Bible says. You're a co-heir with Him. And He's a king. You, know, you have the same inheritance that He does. Now, I'm not saying we're all going to sit on the same throne and all have the same you know, authority. But look, you can make the application that you, know, you are a king this morning. And Deuteronomy is written to you. And look, the reason why it's good for the, for the leader is because it's, it sets an example to the followers, first of all. But he says, It shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy out of the law in, the, in a book. And, you know, we are like, oh, I've got to read the Bible. Yeah, but at least God's not making you sit down and write it. At least God's, you know, I mean, but maybe that would do us some good to sit down and to transcribe the Bible by hand. And sit down with an open copy and say, okay, I'm going to write my own copy out of this. Because back then they didn't have the printing press. You know, everything had to be handwritten. You wanted a copy of the Bible, you know, it wasn't at the dollar store. And let me just say this to every single person who, I know, I just, I'm getting some things off my chest, but these emails, people are like, where can I get a Bible? I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> Do you know where I could find a King James Bible? Uh, I don't know, anywhere. You know, next time you're in a hotel room, look in a drawer. You know, although Gideons are, are going New King James or whatever. Go to a thrift store, go to the Dollar Tree, go to Barnes & Noble, get on Amazon. I mean, it's like the most available product out there. It's like a household commodity. It's so easy to find. And we take it for granted. I mean, there's just stacks of worn-out paperbacks back there already. You know, we give those Bibles out, and I, you know, people would just use them and set them aside. They get all dog-eared and dirty. You know, we just, oh, I'll just grab another one. Oh, I'll just grab another one. And that's fine. If you're using it and reading it, great. But think about being the king back then. You need to know the Word of God. And by the way, you, there's, there's only a few copies here, so if you want to know it, you've got to write it all out by hand. And that's what he commanded him, you know. And all I'm challenging you to do this morning is just to read the Bible one time. Not to write it all out by hand. He's saying, He shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of which, which is before the priests and Levites. And it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life. Not just when he feels like it. Not just when he's in the mood. Not just when you know it, it's Christmas time and Jesus is on my mind. I think I'll read through you know, the story in Luke. And that's the only Bible reading I'm going to do this year. Wrong. He's going to read there all the days of his life. Every single day he was to be in the Word of God. 
so that he could judge and rule and reign with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. You know, we might not be ruling over a kingdom, but we're running our lives. We have other people that we're influencing. We have households that we're running. We're, we're, we're you know, it'll help us in our jobs if we have employ, em, 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 employees or employers. It's going to help us in every area of our life. So why wouldn't you read it every day of your life? To know what it says, that he may learn to fear the Lord as God, to keep all the words of these laws and these statutes, to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Now there's another big reason, is to, is to get, stay humble. You know, nothing will humble you more than Bible reading. I mean, there might be some other things that will come in a, as a very close second. But Bible reading will keep you humble. And a lot of times, you know, if you, if you see somebody getting lifted up with pride, or somebody who becomes very hard-hearted or cold-hearted towards, you know, their brethren, to their, to their fellow Christian, you know, it might be that they're not reading their Bible. That, you know, if I were to take a spiritual diagnosis and see somebody who's lifted up with pride, you know, they're very just you know, puffed up, haughty spirit. You know, if we were to take a spiritual thermometer, the diet, the reading would come back and would say, not reading their Bible. Because when we, read, when we read the Bible, you know, it's a humbling experience. So we start to read about the mistakes other people made in the Bible and go, oh, I, I've done that. Oh, I did that too. Oh, it turns out all these great men of God are flawed just like I am. Oh, it turns out all these prophets and these priests and everybody, they make mistakes too. And oh, it turns out God gets upset with them just like he would get upset with me. And it turns out there's just as much grace and mercy and hope and, and for me when I'm in my time of need that it was there for them. And then we'll read the passage that tell us not to bite and devour one another. We'll read the passages that we're, we're supposed to put on bowels of mercy and charity and compassion and long-suffering and kindness and, and, and be all these things. You know, you're not going to know to do those things if you don't read them. And that's something that's just ad nauseum in the Bible, to be merciful to be long-suffering, to be patient. And when we don't read, you know, we let our own carnal nature get out of control. There's nothing tempering that. We can become very puffed up, and our hearts can become lifted up above even our own brethren. That he turn not aside from the commandment, it says in verse 20, to the right hand or the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. The Bible is saying that if he would just read all the day, days therein, if you read the Bible, all the days of his life, that his kingdom would be prolonged, that his life would literally be prolonged, that, it, you know, that it, it, his children's life would be prolonged. Look, we need to read the Bible, not just because of all the benefits that it brings to us, but because it's commanded. I mean, why do you think God commands us to read the Bible? Why did God give us the Bible? They tell us to read it all the days of our life. Just because he's some cruel taskmaster? Just because he wanted to give you some homework? you going to do while you're away just because there's going to be an exam or a test or something like that? No, because he knows that all the wisdom, because he doesn't, you know, God's not just going to come down here personally and, and speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. And it's important that we all understand that, right? Because <laughs> I've, I've known people that think God talks to them personally and they get into some weird stuff. And a lot of times they end up thinking, anyway, that God doesn't do that. You know, you, do you have a hotline to God? Can you take your phone out this morning and dial a certain number and talk to the Lord? No, but you can do that in prayer, and God speaks to us in his word. And you know what? He blesses us through it. God has given all this and commanded us because he wants to bless us through his word. So reasons to read. One, it's command. How about it's necessary for study? We were in 2 Timothy this morning. It says in chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, we ought to study the word of God. We ought to know what it says. We're not, otherwise, we're going to get caught up in false doctrine. How about for spiritual strength? For spiritual strength. Read the Bible so you can have some spiritual strength. <clears throat> the Bible says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. We need to read God's words for spiritual strength, for spiritual safety. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, Every word of God is pure, He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. You know, if you want to be protected from the, the fiery darts of the wicked today, you know, it's, it, that tower is the word of God. That shield is the word of God. It's going to protect you. It's going to keep you from, uh, you know, to, to help you avoid error. 
And you know what? This is something that even, you know, people who are, have taken on the office of a bishop, you know, pastors today, are unfortunately, um, you know, get, uh, are guilty of this, of being in error in their preaching, and getting up and saying things like, well, hell's not forever. You get out of hell. Or, you know, you, 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 hell's not hot. Start teaching this borderline Jehovah Witness type of doctrine in Baptist churches. How does that happen? Well, there's probably some other explanations, potentially. You know, that's all uh, speculative. But I guarantee you one thing, some Bible reading's not taking place. And if it is, and it's not being understood, well, that leads to other questions. <clears throat> I mean, that's what Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. You can read, go read through Matthew. How many times, and just mark it every time, have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read even so much as this? Over and, over and over again, when he's just rebuking the Pharisees and their false doctrine, what does he always come back to? The Bible. Have you not read? Have you read even so much as this? Have you not, do, do you never read in the scriptures? He's like, did you ever even read the Bible? You know, you got your long robes and your big position and you got the title and everyone's lifting you up and respecting you, but you haven't read the Bible? That's why I want to ask some of these preachers, have you even read it? Because some of the things that they're saying make no sense. They're not scriptural. It makes you wonder if they even read. So hopefully, you know, I've inspired you, or at least exhorted you, to read your Bible, to resolve to read. Look, I think it's great to make resolutions. Uh, you know, I've, I've been mulling over it for the last few weeks, what resolutions I want to make. You know, and, and I thought about preaching a whole sermon on it, but I, I probably won't. Because I think it's a personal thing, and people can, you know, if someone's serious about resolutions, they'll figure out how to make resolutions. But, you know, if you're going to make, you know, let me just give a quick, you know, uh, five-minute thing here or whatever. <laughs> you know, if you're going to make a resolution, you know, m to determine what it is you want to improve and then actually sit down and think about how you're going to do it. You know, well, often we think, I'm going to lose X amount of weight or I'm going to get out of this much debt or I'm going to do this or do that. But we never step down and go think, well, now how am I going to actually accomplish that? How am I, what, am I, what steps am I going to take to actually accomplish this resolution? Whatever it is. And whatever resolutions you have, at the top of that list this year, reading your Bible has to be one of them. And again, I'll say it again. If you've never read your Bible even once, that is the number one resolution for you this, this year. To read it one time. And you know, a lot of, I think the mistake people make is they go, they, they hear a sermon or they get convicted and like, oh, I've got to read my Bible. I've been saved for whatever many years and I've never read my Bible. You know, and they, they think, well, I've got to catch up. So they say, I'm gonna, they've gone from never having read their Bible, like, I'm going to read my Bible seven times. I'm going to read my Bible every 30 days. I've never read my Bible in 30 days. That's a, that's a tall, or, and I know people that have, and they're usually single guys. <laughs> Not a lot else going on, all right? And if, hey, if you're in that time, if that's a time in your life that you're in, and you have the, the, the time and the ability and the resources to sit down and read your Bible in 30 days, I say do it, go for it, if that's something you want to do. But if you've never read the Bible one time, I think that's, a, that's, that's kind of a tall order. Why don't you just work on reading it once? And then next year, say, I'm going to read it twice. And then the following year, you can you know, go from there. Whatever. But how are you going to do that? Say, you know what? I'm convinced. You've inspired me. Or, you know, you've convicted me. There's so many benefits in the Word of God that I can, I, I can glean from just reading it. The wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding is just there waiting for me. You know, or, or you know what? Maybe I, I need to just do it even though I don't feel like it. Because I'm a king, I'm a priest. I need to rule and reign with some wisdom and instruction and understanding. I need to have the wisdom of God in my life to not make these mistakes, to not be lifted up, so on and so forth. Whatever, t you know, whatever camp you're in this morning, you're still, both camps are going to have to do the same thing. How are you going to accomplish that goal? How are you going to accomplish that goal? You, know, you can't just say, I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year and then not think about, well, how many calories do we eat a day? How many calories do I need? You know, am I going to do any exercising? You know, you actually have to sit down and think through the plan, right? And actually execute it. Well, how are you going to say, I'm going to read my Bible this year. How are you going to do it? How are you specifically going to do it? Because this is the part where everyone gets inspired. They hear this. This is the annual Bible reading sermon right before the new year. Everyone gets all amped up. You know, first the year comes, they're, they're cracking open Genesis. Then they, you know, a few weeks go by and they're in Leviticus. And everything gets get real heavy, you know, or dry, as I've heard it called. And look, I was going through Leviticus a couple weeks ago, and I loved it. 
I was noticing things and I was, you know, I was thinking about things. I go into it now thinking about things like, oh, this is that book that talks about this topic. Let me see if I can, you know what I mean? That's, you know, and once you've read your bio a few times, you start to do that. But I like Leviticus. You know, I like all these books. You say, oh, the, the you know, first Chronicles, man, those, those first 16 chapters are heavy. Right? All those names. Someone's like, I got this email. Here I go with the emails again. Why does God have to put all these names in there? Like, it's just name after name. Well, one, it was real practical back then because of the fact that they traced their genealogies. That was a very important thing. But how about, you know, and I used to think the same thing. I remember, and I've been guilty in the past. I would get to those, I would just turn on Scorby and just be like, I'll let him do the talking. <laughs> do you know what I found as someone who has to read the Bible publicly? That that did not help me at all. I mean, it helped to hear how they were pronounced. But you know what's more important is pronouncing it yourself. You know, going, getting a Bible that pronounces those names phonetically will make you a better reader. Slowing down and actually trying to pronounce every name accurately will make you a better reader. Think about that. Just think about the fact that just reading the Bible makes you a better reader. And then, getting, then reading the Bible will get easier and easier. And man, it's cool when you get up and say, our facts add. You know, you get some hard passage in the Bible and you're like, Meshibboleth, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you can nail some name in front of everybody, you know. And I'm not saying we're, we're, you know, we're trying to do it to impress. But you know what? It's a lot better than <laughs> choking on some name. And look, there's, there's pastors that do that. There's preachers, people that have been preaching for decades. I understand some names are hard and everybody makes mistakes. But if that's just like all the time, you know, when you get to those hard passages, read them out loud. Read them out loud, take the time, say them right, it'll make you a better reader. But how are you going to accomplish this task? You've got to read every day. How are you going to read every day? You have to pick a time. Everyone needs to pick a time. And look, you know, I've heard people say you have to read in the morning first thing. And I think that's a great recommendation if that's possible. But some people have to get to work pretty early. You know, not, maybe that's not the best thing for you. Maybe that's not practical. You know, maybe that's where you know, the proverb of the day comes in and then the, 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 the meat of the Bible reading comes in in the evening. You need to read every day. Morning is best, I, I, I think. I think it's best to start out that way. And for most people, that's going to work. You know, if you've got to get up a little earlier, make a little bit stronger pot of coffee, whatever. You know, I know that works well for in my household because usually, for the most part, that's when it's quietest, is in the early morning hours and then after bedtime, right? If you want to be able to concentrate. <coughs> you know, Job said, Neither have I gone back from thy commandment of his li- the commandment of his lips, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know what Job's saying? is like, I'd rather skip breakfast than read my Bible. And you would get more. And you know, that might help with that, that weight loss resolution too, right? It's, it's, it's two birds with one stone, people. Right? He's saying, look, reading the Bible is more important to me than food. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, and that, that, Job's right. You know, you should, that should be our attitude. If we're pressed for time and it comes down to a cheap bowl of cereal and the Word of God, take the Word of God. You know, you're not going to starve to death missing a meal, right? But what I'm getting at is this. You have to pick a time. You have to have some time where you just say, I'm going to read the Bible. And I think that early in the morning is best, but whatever works, whatever's going to get it done. Next, you have to determine how much to read. And again, you know, last year when I, when I preached on this topic, I... I made, I kind of went into like, you know, how you can break down the Bible, you know, and you could count the pages and everything. Look, if you haven't read the Bible one time, 15 minutes a day is the goal. If you're an average reading ability, if you have just average reading skills, 15 minutes a day, 15 to 20 minutes, you will read the whole Bible in a year. People look at the Bible and go, I can't read all that in a year. You don't have 15 minutes? You don't have 20 minutes? Even if it took you a half hour. We can't carve out a half hour, 15, 20 minutes of our day to read the Bible? Well, for all the benefits that it brings to us, all the wisdom and the knowledge, the instruction, all the protection and the, and, and the provision that God gives us through the Word of God, and we can't find 15 minutes to read it. But we'll find 15 minutes for a lot of other things. Some endless run game, you know, or whatever game. Games and distractions and and messages and, 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 and filtering through our junk email or something like, whatever. All the stupid things. You know, I'm going to buy shoelaces. 
You know, people put all these other things. You say, you, you laugh, but people put all these stupid things ahead of the Word of God. Well, I just don't have time to do it. But if we followed you around, I'm sure we could say, well, you could have cut 15 minutes out right there. You could have cut 15, 20, 30 minutes out right there. And the truth is, we could probably find even more time than that, if we were honest. But again, the challenge that I'm putting forth this morning, the resolve that I want people to have is to, if they haven't done it, to at least read their Bible one time this year. Just once. And focus on that and that alone. Put that above everything else. And do it even when you don't want to do it. And the other thing is people, they, they, they have a goal of getting it read, and then they fall back, they miss a day or two or whatever, and then they feel like they have to catch up. So then they go from having to read 15 minutes to have to read 45 minutes. Look, don't do that. If that, if that happens this year, don't do that. Just, just start where you left off and just go back to the 15 minutes. Just go back to whatever we would have got. And if you have to go a week past January 1st, 2022, so what? You know, at least that's, that's a huge leap from last year, right? If you hadn't read it. <coughs> you know, and, and you know, last year I noticed, I pointed out the fact that if you listen to the Bible, if you just listen to Alexander Scorby, which, you know, if you have a smartphone, you can do this. It's free on Android. It's, and I'm telling you, it's worth the 20, 50, whatever bucks it is to get it on an on a, on a Apple phone or whatever. You can find them free. You can, maybe it's not even Scorby. But, you know, Alexander Scorby reads the Bible in 72 hours. That's 20 minutes a day. You could do that on a, on a commute. Now, I, personally, for me, and this is a preference thing, okay? I'm not going to get up and say, and I've heard people say this, you know, listing the Bible doesn't count. That's hogwash, okay? When God commanded in the Old Testament, they would all come together and then they would read the words of, these, of this law in their ears. And they did that once a year. <laughs> and, that was, and God was saying... That's good, right, back then. But look, some people do better with audio. I'm not one of them. I'm a very visual, tactile, that's why I like nicely bound Bibles, because I like feeling it and gets me in the book, right? But some people, they can, they can just listen to it and get things just through audio. That's not really me. But if that's you, look, you know, I'm kind of envious. If you can get the same quality Bible reading out of just listening to it, because now you're multitasking. And now you're driving. And you kind of have to check yourself, I think. Like, I do listen to audio, but I'll notice when I'm not listening anymore, when, I've, when my mind has gone somewhere else, I'll turn it off. You know, because I don't want to just turn into this background where I'm not really listening to it. And, but here's the ideal. You know, this is another thing that I've done in the past and I really like, especially if you're, if you're trying to get the pronunciations down and you're trying to, to hear how the Bible reads. Get not just how words are said, but the actual tone of the passage to where you can get the sense of how, not what's being said, but how it's being said, is to read and listen along. You know, listen to someone reading the Bible like Alexander Scorby and then reading along with him. You know, and, and uh, I've used that in the past because I, I tend to read too fast. I'll start to read quickly and then I'll get through a whole page and be like, what did I just read? You know, because I'm just, the words will go quick. So Scorby actually slows me down and makes me think about what I'm reading. And I'll do that. If I notice I'm getting into that habit, that's what I'll do. So these are just suggestions. You know, I'm just throwing this out there. You know, but at the end of the day, if you're going to resolve to read the Bible, you have to pick a time of day that you're going to read it. You have to pick how you're going to get it done. Are you going to listen to an app? Are you going to just pick up the book and read it? Or, and and, you, and you, the other thing you have to do is you have to keep track of it. You know? and, and this is what I would recommend for everybody. If you're going to do this, read through the Old Testament and the New Testament you know, and, uh, concurrently at the same time. Don't just start in Genesis and then at the very end of the year, knock out the New Testament. Because, you know, the, the New Testament's quite a bit shorter than the Old Testament. And, it, you know, being in the Old Testament, you can kind of get a little depressed if you're in there too long. Because you know? it's, hev it's heavy. I mean, come on, it's just a lot of judgment and people messing up. And, you know, Jesus is in there, but not like he is in the New. You know, and if you're going to emphasize one Testament above the other, it's going to be the New. Um, but I don't want to go on and on about that. But that would be my recommendation. Put a bookmark in Genesis. Put a bookmark in Mark, in Matthew, excuse me. And then just figure out, you know, if I, I got to read X amount of pages in the Old Testament every day to get through this, through it in one year. I got to read X amount of pages in the New Testament every day. And it's real easy to do. Just take the total number of, of, of pages there are, divide it by 365. That's what you got to do. And you'll be surprised how little that actually is. Probably, most Bibles would probably be like four pages of the Old Testament and maybe one or two in the New. It, it would get you through five pages a day. 
But how are you going to do it? You're going to say, I'm going to resolve to read this year. Pick a time. And, and how are you going to get it done? And keep track of it. Get a checklist, something. Get bookmarks, do something. <coughs> and then, then this, is the, this is the warning I always give when I, when, I, when I talk about this, is that don't let the Bible become just a math problem to you. You know, maybe, you're, you know, and that shouldn't be a problem if you're just trying to read it once. And it's not, it's not, if, but, you know, I remember there was a time when I was trying to read it, like, quite a few more times than one. You know, trying to reach this certain mark of having read it ten times. And what I found was that it just came about checking off a list. Just, just scratching off my checklist, just getting through my Bible reading. And it kind of made the Bible just like this, this, this chore, this task, this math problem that I had to just, you know, fit, finish, figure out, and get done, right? And you don't want that to happen. And look, that's not going to be a problem if you're trying to only read it one time. But you know what? Maybe you're in the room this morning, and you've already read the Bible once. You know, again, you are in a very elite category of Christians having read the Bible one time. And you say, I'm ready to read it more. I'm going to try to read it three, four, five times, which is kind of like those upper limits of reading, okay? You say, I'm going to try and do that. That's great, but don't make, let it become just about get, getting, a, you know, marking off, I've read the Bible five times. Because it's not just the physical reading, it's what you're reading that matters. It's what God is saying when you're reading it that matters the most. Absorbing that knowledge and that wisdom that God has in the Word of God. That's why we read. We don't read just so we can go, well, next year when, Pat, when Brother Corbin reads, you know, preaches this sermon, I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to be sweating so much because I, <laughs> I did it this year. You know what I mean? That's not why you're reading, reading the Bible. This is all to motivate you to read the Bible. Because why? Because it's through God's Word that He blesses us. It's through God's Word that we benefit in all these other areas of our life. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What is the light that's going to guide us through this dark world? The Bible says that the whole world lieth in wickedness. That we are, we are living in a world where, where the, 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 the God of this present world reigns, the prince of the power of the air. We're living in a very dark world, spiritually speaking. You know, and this is the illustration I always use. If we were all to go out the, on, the, on a moonless, cloudy night in the darkest parts of some wood somewhere, just pitch black, can't see your hand in front of your face, and I handed you a flashlight, you know, that flashlight's going to be pretty important to you. So you've got to find your way back. Here's, your, here's the only thing I'm giving you, a flashlight. It's got, enough hour, you know, it's got enough battery to get you all the way there. You wouldn't just put that in your back pocket and say, I'll use that later, and then just proceed to stumble through the woods trying to find your way home. You'd have that light out, and you'd be watching where you're going. That light would be pretty important. It'd be a lot more important to you in that situation than if, if we just walked out in the parking lot this afternoon and I handed you a flashlight. You'd say, oh, I don't need this. But you know what? Spiritually, we need that flashlight. We are in the woods in this world. We are in the pitch black night of, of Satan's kingdom. And you know, I'm not just trying to be dramatic here. That's the truth. We live in a dark world today, spiritually. It's hard to believe that living in, you know, Arizona where it's sunny all the time. But if we could see things spiritually, there is a dark cloud in this world that's just blocking out the light. But you know what? God has given us a flashlight. God has given us a light and a lamp unto our feet and unto our path. What is it? It's the Word of God. So how are you treating the Word, the light that God has given you? You know, have you, has it been a while since you turned it on and looked around? You know, that's my challenge to you this year. Resolve to read the Bible at least once if you haven't. Let's go ahead and pray.